I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Welcome. To, for, thank you for joining us once more this Sunday morning on Online Church for our fifth part of our Origins series, God's Whole Person Wellness Plan. I'm Jimmy and I'll be your host and speaker this morning as we go through the topic of the original diet. Before we begin, I'd just like to invite you as we bow our heads and close our eyes to say a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just want to thank you, Lord, that for this time that we can come together to learn from your Bible and from the science about what your original plans were for our diet. And so, Lord, as we begin now, we just want to ask that um, we will learn and know how to apply this message to ourselves and also to those that we love and care for, and we might give us wisdom to know how we can share it with others too. We want to thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. We ask this in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So thank you once more, and we'll just go straight into our talk. The original diet. Um, as we look at the Bible, um, it's clear that the original diet was a whole foods, plant-based diet. You know, we read in Genesis 1.29, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Our original diet, which was a whole foods, plant-based diet, would allow us to um, overcome some of the problems we face in this world. So the first problem is um, food inequality. You know, following this diet would allow us to feed um, the whole world. Now, um, we there's a 2003 study that looked at the amount of grain um, fed to U.S. livestock, and what they found was that the amount of grain fed in one year to U.S. livestock was sufficient to feed 84 million people on a plant-based diet. 84 million people. Wow, that's more. That's almost. Um, that's just over double the Australian cu current population of Australia. A, a one kilogram animal uh, protein takes a hundred times more water to produce than one kilo of grain-based protein, and a kilo of fresh beef takes thirteen kilos of grain and thirty kilograms of hay to produce. The second problem that being on a whole foods plant-based diet would help address is that of greenhouse emissions. This chart here shows how the different varying um, activities of mankind um, release and uh, create greenhouse gases. Now certainly by no means is agriculture the largest contributor to greenhouse gases, uh, but it certainly has a significant contribution. You can see there it's about 12%. And certainly one wonders what would happen if rather than raising all these animals to eat for meat, whether our, um, our carbon footprint might be slightly smaller if we raise them for their wool and for their uh, milk um, and eggs, etc. instead, instead of raising them for, for their meat. Um, here's another chart. This chart's very interesting. This looks at um, the amount of resources needed to produce plant-based food or animal-based foods. And what we see here on the chart, um, so the plant-based foods on this chart here are everything on the left of that central dotted line. The animal-based foods are everything on the right of the dotted line. And what it's clear here is that animal-based foods are a lot more resource intensive than plant-based foods. You know, um, even for eggs and dairy, where it's similar to roots and tubers, um, in terms of water use, 
Um, certainly from a land use perspective, we see that it's not equivalent. They use a lot more land than for roots and tubers. Uh, but what are there any other benefits for a whole foods plant-based diet? Well, we're going to look at um, first thing we want to look at is what is a whole foods and plant-based diet? We just have to look at the original diet. So obviously it's whole foods minimally processed. Now we want to try to eat foods as close to how they were in nature as possible. Now that's not always possible and certainly you don't have to eat the foods raw so for instance it's okay to have pasta and uh, breads uh, you don't have to make it yourself uh, but we do want to have it minimally processed and the other thing that we're trying to aim for in this diet is plant-based so what is plant-based um, it's I remember walking into a, um, a Greek restaurant once and um, you know saying that I was vegetarian and so they gave me the seafood menu um, and so the, a common misconception is that um, seafood, white meat, that's not meat. When we talk about plant-based, we really do mean plant-based. So it's a, a diet that um, nothing that had a eyes and a face, nothing that had a mum and a dad, um, nothing needed to die to make the food for us to eat. Now, um, what are the benefits of being on a plant-based diet? Well, this is probably one of the areas that has been most extensively researched. There are, there are numerous large studies that demonstrates that fruits, vegetables, legumes, or lower or cause mortality. And this includes some of the largest studies that we've ever done in the field of medicine looking at lifestyle factors. Uh, what are some of these studies? Um, for those who are medically or scientifically inclined, they, these include big studies like the inter-heart study looking at the major risk factors for heart disease, the inter-stroke study, the studies looking at the major risk factors for stroke. And you know, one study which where it was interesting because they looked at a group of people who had everything was the same from a demographics perspective. The only difference within this population was their diet. They looked in this study at how meat users or those who were uh, omnivorous, how their health compared to those who were vegetarian or vegans and what they found was that the overall mortality was 12% lower in those who were vegetarian or vegan and others have confirmed similar findings you know an Australian study demonstrates recently that having seven servings of fruit and vegetables per day lowered all-cause mortality by 10% compared to those who had the least amount of fruit and vegetables now what are the health benefits of a plant-based diet? We're going to look specifically at certain areas of health. We're going to look at heart disease, diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes. We're going to look at obesity, cancer, the immune system, and the gut microbiome. Now, to begin with, we're going to, I'm just going to share a story. This gentleman here, his name is Joseph Crow. He's an American surgeon, um, a quite a successful surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic in the United States. In 1996, when he was in his 40s, um, he just had a very busy day at work. He just finished a day of operating um, and seeing patients, and he was just tired. He just wanted to go home. Um, and so as he left the operating theater and got changed, as he was heading out to his back to his office, all of a sudden, he felt some heaviness in his chest. And initially, he didn't think too much of it. He continued to clean up his desk, do a bit more paperwork, and then, okay, let's head off home. I just, it's a really busy day. I don't want to hang around the hospital any longer. But as he prepared to um, head home, the heaviness got heavier and heavier, and he got more and more uncomfortable in his chest. And so he was starting to get worried, and it bothered him enough that he decided, no, I better get this checked out. And so he went to the emergency department downstairs, and sure enough, he was having a heart attack and so he had he was seen he had an emergency angiogram and what was found was what we see here on the diagram on the right the picture on the right that he had a blockage of one of the major arteries of his heart what we call the LAD for short I um, mean this is a major artery that supplies a big part of the muscle of uh, the heart um, and what we can see here is if you can see my um, um, at the lower part of the um, 
the angiogram, you see that where the yellow part marks, there is a sudden narrowing of the blood vessel, and it's quite narrowed. And unfortunately for Dr. Crow, the narrowing was at a place where that was so far down the artery that they couldn't do what we call bypass surgery. They couldn't put a graft, a new blood vessel, a new plumbing to, to bridge across and, and bypass the blockage because it was just there was there was no way to attach the lower end of the bypass too. And also, unfortunately for Dr. Crow, um, as you can see there, that his artery has a funny twist and turns in it so that it wasn't safe for these um, heart doctors to put a stent in it because there was just too many angles in his arteries. And so he was basically told that, look, unfortunately, we can't do anything. You're going to have to be in a lifetime of medications. And that wasn't something he was particularly keen about either because he was aware that there were some um, side effects to being on medications. So what to do? Well, we're going to find out. Now, what is heart disease? Heart disease um, is properly, um, we, could, we should call it cardiovascular disease. And what that means is that this is a disease not just of your heart, but of all blood vessels in your bodies, particularly the arteries. Now, what happens in this disease is that um, when someone has a meal that is um, either high in fat um, uh, or has a predisposition towards making lots of cholesterol, the end result is that there's lots of fat and cholesterol floating in their bloodstream and through an inflammatory process, usually either being on an inflammatory diet um, or having some other form of inflammation, um, such as an inflammatory diet, so things like a meat-based diet or a sugar a diet high in sugar and high in fat, um, that the inflammation causes the lining of the arteries to become sticky and it then allows the cholesterol and the fats to enter and build up in the walls of the artery. And so what, that's what we're seeing here in the diagram on the, on the right, that we see a small mountain of cholesterol slowly building up over time. Now this becomes an issue um, for one of three reasons. The buildup of the cholesterol, what we call a cholesterol plaque, um, this process is known as atherosclerosis, the cholesterol plaque can weaken the wall so that the artery can actually pop and rupture. And the commonest case it does so is in the major artery of your body called the aorta. And so you have what we call aortic aneurysm. And that's if it ruptures, obviously it's lethal, life-threatening, uh, if not lethal. Um, the other thing that can happen is that it can cause a buildup of the, um, pl the plaque can get so large that it gets to um, such a state that there's actually insufficient blood flowing past um, that buildup. And then things distal to the blockage um, don't get enough blood and that causes issues with that organ or tissue. Um, the other possibility is that the plaque continues to build but what happens is that the covering on the plaque gets soft and for whatever reason and we don't yet know why and how when it happens but that cap can sometimes pop and if the cap uh, breaks it leaks out all the cholesterol from within the plaque and that cholesterol when it comes out is very irritating to the blood and so it causes a blood clot to form. And when a blood clot forms, there's a sudden blockage in the artery and bang, suddenly whatever's distal to that no longer has the oxygen it needs. And depending on uh, where it is, that then causes the disease. Now, um, it's interesting to note that um, the lining of the arteries normally um, release a gas called nitric oxide and that's actually protective against this forming. However, this protection is lost when someone has a fatty meal. The fat in the meal actually blocks the cells from releasing the nitric oxide and does so for a number of hours after. So after a fatty meal, it takes between three to four hours for the nitric cells to be able to produce nitric oxide again. Now, obviously, three to four hours is a similar time frame to when we have our next meal for most people. Now, as I indicated before, when there's a blockage, what happens? If the blockage is in the heart, we get heart disease. We get chest pains, we get heart attack. If the blockage is in an artery that goes to the brain, someone has a stroke. If the, artery is, if the artery supplies the penis in a guy, we have erectile dysfunction. They can't get it up. Um, if the artery is for a blood vessel in the arms or the legs, we have peripheral vascular disease. And that's where people can have really pale fingers, really pale toes that suddenly go blue or black and then drop off. And obviously, these are all major, major complications and major, major health issues. What is the natural course of cardiovascular disease or heart disease? Does it, can it get better by itself? Well, 
we just have to look to one famous example. In 2004, Bill Clinton, the President of the United States, suffered a heart attack. And he was rushed to hospital. Um, he was found that he had m multiple vessels blocked and he needed a quadruple bypass. That's four bypasses to overcome blockages in four different areas of the heart. Quite a big operation. He got better, he got well, and he thought, great, I can get on with life. Unfortunately for him, six years later in 2010, he woke up one morning feeling quite unwell. And he looked in the mirror, he looked a bit grey and ashen, he just didn't feel right. And so he called his cardiologist, and his cardiologist said, look, just come straight to the hospital, let's check you out. And when they took him into the hospital, they sent him straight to the um, to have an emergency procedure done. And sure enough, when they had a look, what had happened was that one of the bypasses had blocked off. He was having another episode of chest pains from his heart. And so again, he needed another procedure. He needed to put some stents in this time to reopen that blockage. Now, Clinton and a lot of other people would be thinking, what? Again? I only had this procedure done six years ago. Why am I having a repeat procedure? Why am I getting symptoms again? Um, and so um, when one of the cardiologists that was at the hospital where Bill Clinton was being treated, when he was interviewed by the media, this is what he had to say. An important aspect that a lot of people don't realize is that neither coronary angioplasty, that's where we put a balloon to open up the blockage, nor cardiac bypass surgery, that's where we popped a graft or another blood vessel to bypass the blockage. Neither of these procedures are curative for coronary artery disease. It tends to be a lifelong condition that patients have, and they need to constantly work on risk factor modification and lifestyle changes to slow the progression of the disease down as much as possible. Notice the wording. Even with the best medical science, with the best interventions that money can buy. We can only slow down the disease process. That's what a cardiologist says um, at the back of that time. We can only slow down the process. In other words, you've had a heart attack. We expect you'll get another heart attack sometime down in the future. But through all these procedures, we hope to extend your life a number of years and delay your next heart attack as long as possible and hope for the best that it's not fatal the next time it comes around. Is that what we should be expecting? Is that what's normal? Well, Bill Clinton remembers very clearly that he gave a, um, that his doctors gave a press conference where they tried to downplay the severity of what was going on. Um, and that basically they normalized to say, yeah, yeah, look, everyone who's had a heart attack, we know that it's a risk factor for them having their next heart attack and ha next heart um, event. And so this is quite a normal process. There's nothing special about this. And after he watched that media, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the press release, um, an old friend of his by the name of Dr. Dean Ornish called, uh, sent him an email. And when he read the email, it was quite a blistering email, actually. Um, he read a, a comment along the lines of, yeah, it's normal what Bill Clinton experienced um, because fools like you don't eat like you should. Wow, that's quite a strong statement to make to a president. I guess it was an old friend. But what did Dean Ornish mean by fools like you don't eat like you should? Is he indicating that there's a diet that someone can be on that would do better than modern medicine, that would stop the progression of the disease? Well, we're going to have a look at the evidence. Multiple large studies, so meta-analyses are big scientific studies looking at the science that other people have done. And so why that's powerful is because a lot of people put a lot of work in. They put all everyone's work on the same topic together and analyze it all together. Well, there's been multiple large meta-analyses that demonstrate that fruit and vegetables lower the risk of heart disease and stroke. The olive oil lowers the risk of cardiovascular disease. Nuts do the same and fiber does the same. Um, perhaps one of the best, the di two diets that have been best studied on um, health and cardiovascular disease um, are the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet. And both of these are linked to a lower risk of heart disease. What's really important to note about the common feature of both of these diets is that they're both high in fruits and particularly high in vegetables. 
and both diets are very low in meat and low in salt. And in fact, studies clearly show that with a dietary intervention, it could decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease by 80%. That's a lot. 80% of heart disease could be prevented if we simply did something with our diets. And so one of the studies then also looked at the dietary interventions that would have the um, big impact. And so all they did was look at one intervention. Now, often when we talk about someone going to a healthy diet, we'd like for them to change everything in the diet. Sure, a step at a time, but it's no good being on a part healthy diet. But here, what's really interesting is all they did was just a part change. And so what they found was that fruits in and of themselves, without looking at any other factor in the diet, was beneficial from a heart disease perspective. Vegetables in and of themselves were beneficial in heart disease perspective. We see that um, nuts and olive oils were beneficial, whole grains were beneficial, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the studies show that from a stroke perspective, that fruits and vegetables, olive oil and nuts, they are the best things you can have to prevent yourself from getting a stroke, regardless of what your heritage is. And that you're from a increasing your risk of stroke, um, it is your processed and unprocessed meats and your salt, uh, your salt that is going to increase your risk. Now, how about for heart disease? Well, here is a very interesting study. It's a very small study, mind you, but it is quite interesting. There was a surgeon by the name of Caldwell Esselstyn, and he did a small series um, looking at patients. Now, when he was asking around his cardiology colleagues to give him patients for his study, um, they weren't particularly uh, impressed by what they, he was trying to do. They just thought, what's a surgeon trying to do who's not even heart-related? And so... Uh, for whatever reason, there weren't many uh, patients that came by his way. But the patients he did finally get were all very sick with heart disease. They were no longer candidates for stents or bypass surgery. And basically, across the board, all of them had been advised that you know there was nothing more that modern medicine can offer you. And some of them had basically been told that, you look, you're just going home and just prepare to die because, look, we're, we're sorry, but there's nothing more that can be done for your heart and you're really sick. So these are the type of patients that Coldwell Esselstyn inherited for his study. He put all of them on a no free fat diet and he aimed for a very, very, very low fat content diet that was plant-based with a very low dose of cholesterol-lowering medications. And as I said, all these patients had end-stage heart disease, they had severe heart disease. Now, the diagram on the right is an angiogram from one of these patients. And so what's really interesting is that this gentleman, after being on this diet for five years, we can, if you can see the dark arrow in the, um, near the top of each angiogram, um, he initially had a, quite a significant narrowing in one of the branches that we can see there. But five years on, that narrowing is significantly opened up. That, that narrowing is, has decreased by more than 30%. That's amazing. Uh, up until this study, it was unheard of for anyone to have their heart disease reversed. In fact, um, even these days, when I talk about um, heart disease and um, I talk about this study, um, some of my doctor colleagues think I'm joking. They said, what? Impossible. Heart disease just does not reverse. Um, and so they didn't believe me when I talked to Spectrum about it. Now, remember this gentleman, Joseph Crow? Well, he worked at Cleveland Clinic, and fortunately for him, Caldwell Esselstyn was also based at the Cleveland Clinic. And so, um, he, um, through colleagues, he found out that Caldwell Esselstyn was doing this very unique trial, and he went downstairs, found um, Dr. Esselstyn, and had a chat to him. And then after a bit of a chat, he says, look, um, I, wanna, uh, I don't particularly want to take medication. Let's have a try of the diet. And so that's what he did. He went on Caldwell Esselstyn's diet, a low-fat diet. Uh, unlike his the trial patients, Dr. Crow didn't want medications, and so he went on the diet and died alone. There was no cholesterol-lowering medication. So this is his angiogram, we'll remember, from before, when he was first diagnosed with his heart disease. And this is after he was on Esselstyn's diet for just under three years, so 32 months later. 
And what's really incredible about the angiogram we see is that on the left hand side, we see quite significant narrowing over an extended stretch of his artery. And yet under three years later on diet alone, we're seeing that almost all of that narrowing is gone. This is disease reversal. This is heart disease being reversed. And this is on diet alone, remember. This is incredible. Does heart, can heart disease be reversed? Was it just luck? Well, we're going to look at, this is a study by Dr. Dean Ornish. This is the doctor who um, um, gave that blistering email to Bill Clinton to say, look, what are you doing? Only fools would just keep doing the same thing after your first heart attack. So Dean Ornish had done a study. And what he did was that in one group, they just continued with best medical care. That's your normal medications after a heart attack, including your cholesterol lowering medication, your advice to eat healthier, and then just follow up. The other group, he did something different. He didn't put them on any cholesterol lowering medication. He put them all on a whole foods plant-based diet that was quite low in fat, not as low as Caldwell Esselstyn's, but it was fairly low, and also did some other lifestyle measures. And what we see here is that at baseline, they all had narrowings in the arteries that were quite similar. This is the graph on the left. But over time, at the one year mark, um, the people on best standard heart care had a continued progression of the narrowing of the arteries, whereas those on the lifestyle care did not. And then five years on, the lifestyle group actually had a slight decrease in the narrowing of their heart, nar uh, heart artery na um, narrowing. But for the control group, the group that was on cholesterol lowering medications, but just the best standard heart, heart care, they had a further worsening of the narrowing in their heart arteries. Now, what's really even more impressive, because if you look at that, you just say, okay, there's, they separate and compared to baseline, being on the lifestyle treatment only decreased the, um, the narrowing by about 2.5%. That's not much. So he reanalyzed his data and looked at those who were most adherent to the lifestyle program versus those who were least adherent to the lifestyle program. And this is the graph on the right. And what we he found was that those who were most strict with themselves, so applied themselves that were most applied, uh, did the lifestyle program as close as possible. These people had a 7% reduction in this uh, degree of narrowing that the arteries had compared to those who were the least adherent. The least adherent almost had no change. They didn't progress, but they didn't get much benefit either. And that's incredible. And so, you know, that um, shows again, two studies showing that heart disease can be reversed and how based on lifestyle, based on how we eat. You know, we saw before how meat, particularly um, processed meat, red meat um, and salt are, in, are linked to, with an increased risk of stroke. But here we, uh, but there are multiple studies that also show that red meat, processed meat, chicken, so poultry, these also all increase the risk of heart disease um, and not just heart disease, but they increase the death rate from heart disease and they also increase all cause mortality. When Clinton had his second um, heart attack and then received the blistering email, thankfully, he learned from his mistake. Let's have a look at this video to show what Clinton thought afterwards and what, what change he made. How do you lose so much weight? Uh, what kind of diet are you on? My, uh, the short answer is I went on essentially a plant-based diet. I live on uh, uh, beans, legumes, vegetables, fruit. I drink a protein supplement every morning. I, no dairy. I drink almond milk mixed in with fruit and a protein powder. So I get the protein for the day when I start the day out. And it changed my whole metabolism and I lost 24 pounds. And I got back to basically what I weighed in high school. But I did it for a different reason. But I mean, I wanted to lose a little weight, but I didn't ever dream this would happen. I did it because after I had this stent put in, I realized that even though it happens quite often that after you have bypasses, you lose the veins because they're thinner and weaker than arteries. 
The truth is that it clogged up, which means that the cholesterol was still calling buildup in my vein that was part of my bypass. And thank God I could take the stents. I don't want it to happen again. So I did all this research and I saw that 82% of the people since 1986 who have gone on a plant-based, no dairy, no meat of any kind, no chicken, turkey, I eat very little fish. Once in a while I'll have a little fish, not often. If you can do it, 82% of the people who've done that have begun to heal themselves. Their arterial blockage cleans up, the calcium deposit around their heart breaks up. Wow. Now we're going to move on to the original diet and diabetes. You know, studies show that as one moves from being a non-vegetarian, that was that we eat meat, and this study was actually quite incredible. Those who ate meat didn't eat it that frequently. They ate it. Um, those who ate meat were um, greater than equal to one time a week. In other words, those who ate the um, meat were once a week or more. To semi-vegetarian in other words these people then ate meat they did eat meat but ate it less than weekly um, to pescatarian so pescatarians are those who eat fish to vegetarian so they they eat plant-based diet but they also have eggs and dairy to vegan that's all plant-based no eggs no dairy um, what what studies what the scientists found was that the risk of diabetes decreases in a stepwise manner um, and particularly what they noticed was that the vegans and vegetarians had about half the rate of diabetes compared to those who were non-vegetarian even after adjusting for other confounding factors including BMI. And if we have a look on the graph on the right, this is what um, the data showed that those who were omnivore, so eat everything, their risk of um, uh, getting type 2 diabetes was 7.6%. Those who are semi-vegetarian, that's really incredible. Semi-vegetarian eating meat less than weekly. That's not much meat at all. Eating weak meat less than weekly, their risk of getting diabetes was 6.1%. In other words, less than the omnivores. But let's compare that to the vegetarians. Those who eat meat less than weekly still had almost double the risk of getting diabetes compared to those who were vegetarian um, and um, and compared to those who were vegan. And what we see here also is that the difference between those who are vegan and vegetarian there's not a huge amount of difference. Although the vegans did um, come out slightly better. And so what that suggests to us is even a small um, amount of meat intake can increase the risk of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, quite significantly. Now, um, this is another study done by a different research group. Um, the research, the key researcher was Neil Barnard. Neil Barnard um, is probably one of the... Um, uh, is famous for setting up the Neil Barnard's um, prevention and reversal of diabetes program. And he's done a lot of research, a lot of work in this area. Um, he, he demonstrated that a low-fat, whole foods, plant-based diet, that's a vegan diet, was as good as the American Diabetics Association diet in losing weight. However, the whole foods, plant-based diet lowered bad cholesterol and improved the HbA1c which is a measure of how good blood sugar control is over a three-month period, um, that the whole foods plant-based diet improved the cholesterol and the HbA1c um, more than the standard diabetic diet. And multiple studies have since demonstrated the same thing. Now, just a note that losing weight helps reverse diabetes. So this researcher decided, researcher decided to find out that, look, what if being on a whole foods plant-based diet and people losing weight, what if that's the cause of them uh, reversing their diabetes? And so this research did something very interesting. Not everyone with diabetes is overweight or obese. And so he found those who were lean and yet had type 2 diabetes. And then what he did was that he kept their weight stable, kept their weight steady while he introduced a whole foods plant-based diet. And so this was a diet that was high in carbs high in fiber but low in fat and so you actually they calculated from the percentage was that less than 10 percent of the all total calories per day were from fat but 70 percent of all total calories were from carbs and it was quite a high fiber diet it was 65 grams of fiber per day that's equivalent of what people would eat in um, africa or 
um, in the, um, undeveloped China. The modern Western world, most people would eat probably under half of that fiber a day if they were good. And the current Western recommended dietary fiber intake is about 55 grams for men and th about 45 for women. So it's actually a lot higher than even the recommended. So a high fiber diet, high carb diet, but low fat. And what we found or what the researchers found was that even keeping the weight stable and to do that, they had to feed them more carbs to maintain their weight. So even keeping the weight stable, people improved from a diabetes perspective. In fact, it improved so much that for the average participant, they dropped about 15 units of insulin. The average went from 26 units to 11 units um, of insulin per, um, in terms of daily use. And more than that, 11 of 20 patients, so just over half of the patients, came off insulin as well by the end of the study. That's quite incredible. How about for obesity? Now, as we talked about before, um, the biggest risk factor for diabetes is obesity. So if we can reduce a person's weight, we can reverse a type 2 diabetes. And so this is a, they just sort of go hand in hand. And so this is where it's quite important because being overweight actually has significant health com complications, um, diabetes only being one of them. And so a big study looking at um, what we call the Adventist Health Study 2, so it looked at a bunch of people who were living um, on a healthy diet, uh, sorry, were living a healthy lifestyle, so that they were controlling for activities, for smoking, um, for demographics, uh, but that had slightly differing um, uh, dietary patterns. So some were omnivorous, they had meat and some didn't. Um, they, what they found was that those who were vegetarian and vegan were less likely to be obese. And so we just see this in the orange part of the chart on the right, where being a vegan, most people were in the no normal BMI range of 23.6, but being vegetarian, some of them bumped over into the uh, um, overweight range. Um, and then well, as we go from there to those who eat fish, that's pescatarians, to semi-vegetarians, who so eat meat less than weekly, to omnivores, so eat meat at least once or more per week. But we see that once we hit omnivore, that weight is a lot closer to being in the obese range. Obesity is diagnosed at BMI of 30, and that's a BMI of about 29. Um, and studies in... So, is this the only way we, to lose weight? Well, no. The science clearly shows that there are multiple diets that are very good at losing weight. Um, some of these studies are the, uh, some of these diets rather, are the Atkins diet, that's a high meat intake, high fat, so high protein, high fat diet. The Weight Watchers diet, that's a diet where they um, calorie count and control portions and it's guided by a dietitian, tailored to the person. The Zone diet, um, you know, these all help with weight loss. and studies show that what determines successful weight loss actually isn't the diet it's more how um, stringent the adherents are in terms of, or how well someone adheres to any diet the better someone adheres to the diet the more weight loss we have and so weight loss can occur no matter what method you choose you can go on a high protein high fat diet you can go on a plant-based diet um, you can have surgery we know that those who have lap bands who have gastric stapling and gastric bypass surgery, we know that they'll drop 20, 30, 40 kilos after their operation and they'll reverse their diabetes. The question to ask is not which diet is most or which method is most effective at decreasing our weight and thus reversing our diabetes. The question to ask is at what cost? Would someone be happy to have their belly cut open, their stomach stapled, so that for forever after they need to be ha having a liquid diet for the rest of their lives to be able to lose their weight. Would someone be happy to run the risk of having complications from surgery and obviously and everything associated with that and be happy to pay the cost bariatric surgery, so stomach stapling, gastric bypasses, these are expensive, expensive operations. Is someone happy to pay the cost of that up quite aside from the medical risks? Um, how about for meat? Is there a cost associated with using meat? Well, for that, we're going to move to the next topic of food and cancer. Now, it's old news that we know certain foods cause cancer. I think most of us know that. We all know that smoked meats, cured meats, um, the, the nitrates, they all slightly increase the risk of 
cancer. Uh, but more recent studies are showing that um, that even less innoc uh, more simple meats and meats that we don't classically associate with bad stuff, these can actually cause cancer too. In fact, the World Cancer Research Fund did a phenomenal study that was released uh, a number of years back. And the concluding statement was basically that the CUP panel, so there's a panel of scientists that was from a subcommittee that looked specifically at certain diets and certain cancers. This CUP panel agreed that the recent evidence was consistent with the conclusion of the other committee, this SER, that red meat is a convincing cause of colorectal cancer, and also that processed meat is a convincing cause of colorectal cancer. What did they mean by convincing cause? It meant that it was beyond reasonable doubt. Um, what do they mean by convincing cause? It's like that smoking is a convincing cause of lung cancer. Meat is a convincing cause of bowel cancer. Con Further, this same committee said that food containing dietary fiber were considered probable uh, to protect against colorectal cancer and that the evidence for a protective offense from foods containing dietary fiber had strengthened and could be upgraded to convincing again convincing beyond a reasonable doubt now what's really interesting to note is that fiber is only found in plant foods fiber is only found in plant foods it is not found in meat now quite apart from meat so 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 that answers our question is there a cost to using an atkins diet yeah, there is. Increases the risk of cancer. And it also increases, as we saw before, it increases the risk of heart disease. Um, there's lots, there's a high cost to following that path. So we reverse the diabetes with weight loss from an Atkins diet or a high protein, high fat diet, but we're going to increase the risk of cancer and heart disease. But quite apart from red meat, are the, um, what else in, the, in our diets that increases our risk of cancer? Well, the next one that is starting to be highlighted by the media is um, probably one of the most acceptable um, uh, toxins, um, and that's alcohol. And so as we look here, you know, alcohol is known to increase seven types of cancer. And it's basically, if you have a look at it, it's basically anything that alcohol touches, it's going to cause cancer in that region. It increases the risk of cancer in your back of your throat, your, your pharynx. It increases the cancer of your larynx, which is lower down in your throat. It increases the risk of cancer in your swallowing pipe or the esophagus. It increases the risk of cancer from a liver perspective, from a bowel perspective. And for females, it increases the risk of breast cancer. But isn't alcohol good for us? Isn't alcohol good for our heart? Well, um, there... For many years, there was a lot of debate in the community, uh, in the health community. Surely alcohol is beneficial for us, but why are we finding studies where it's harmful? And does the benefit for the heart or any other health benefits from alcohol outweigh the harms that it causes? Well, because of the uncertainty, the WHO commissioned a large study looking at just that topic. Is alcohol beneficial for us? And so they did this over many years, and it was completed in 2016. And this is what they found. Um, they looked, the study looked at, um, was an international study. It looked at the evidence from multiple different countries in different social economic groups um, and looked at the health benefits and the harms in multiple different health areas. And so this is um, the summarized version of the total world um, benefits versus harms for females. Anything above the line zero, there's a dotted line that you can see horizontally. Line zero, anything above that line is harm. Anything below that line is benefit. And so what we see here is that globally, and I haven't shown you the breakdown, but, uh, but for every social demographic group, whether it be low income, middle income, or high income country, for every age bracket, for females, there was never a time where the benefits outweighed the harms. What we see, in fact, is that across every, the whole spectrum of age, ages in females across the world, the harms always outnumbered the benefit and always outnumbered significantly. You see here that up until 
a woman turns 60 to 64, it's harm, 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 harm from alcohol and no benefit. And it's not until someone hits about 94 to older than 94, older than 90 plus rather, that there's some benefits and those benefits are about half of those of the harms that that 90 plus year old will suffer. How about for men? Well, the results for men is actually even more astounding. Across all social economic groups, across all age brackets, um, the harms done for males with alcohol vastly exceeded the benefits that a man could experience. And so we see here that the amount of harm that's above that zero line was so much that they had to change the scale compared to what the females and that there's almost no benefits at all for men at any um but that by the time they had benefits again it was vastly vastly outweighed almost by three to one to four to one by the harms that it would do at the same age bracket and so the conclusion of those researchers was that we found that the risk of all cause mortality and of cancers specifically rises with increasing levels of alcohol consumption and that the level of consumption that minimizes health loss that is what is a safe level of alcohol that we can use? The safe level is zero. There is no safe limit for alcohol. Even a sip does damage. We know that worldwide, 5.5% of all cancers are attributable directly to alcohol consumption. That's one in 20 cancer deaths directly related to alcohol. It is known as a class one carcinogen. What is a class one carcinogen? It's the same as knowing that arsenic is bad for you. If you drink arsenic, you're gonna get into trouble. If you drink alcohol, you're gonna get into trouble. What, so how can we get some of the health benefits that we were seeing in the science from that glass of wine? Well, the benefits is derived from something called polyphenol. And you can get the same benefits of polyphenol from having 24 grams of walnuts, 1.5 apples, 158 grams of almonds, 85 grams of blueberries, 178 mils of pomegranate juice, or 270 grams of cranberries. And of course, you can get the same benefits by drinking unfermented natural grape juice, or better yet, eating the grapes themselves because the polyphenols are found on the grape skins. You know, and so what we're finding from cancer is that the majority, so or, or rather a large portion, uh, and this is from American statistics, but 40% of cancers are preventable. And that the top um, six preventable causes, many of them, if not all of them, are lifestyle related. And so we see that um, alcohol ranks up there, obesity, uh, and then from a diet perspective, poor diet. So that's 2%, uh, and that's low fruit and vegetable intake. That's what poor diet means. Now, we know that from a cancer-causing perspective, red meat and processed meats are bad. We know that um, alcohol and smoking is bad, and we know that sugar is bad, and also fast food is bad. We know that fruits and vegetables and fiber are good. Is there anything else? Well, this is where we um, introduce another story. Meet David Servan Schreiber. So he is a doctor. He, he was a doctor. He was a PhD um, researcher as well. And he was a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Um, prolific researcher, had multiple scientific articles published. One day while he and his team were working on a research project um, dealing with imaging the brain, um, one of their research candidates didn't show up. And because the subject didn't show up and it's really expensive to run an MRI machine, um, he decided that, okay, the team decided rather that he would jump in and be the uh, test candidate instead. So he would get his brain scanned so that they could keep the MRI machine going and make up the numbers for their studies. Unfortunately, what they found on the MRI machine, or, or rather what they found on his brain scan, was this. And you can see that big white mass in the front part of his brain. That is a very, very nasty form of brain cancer, what we call a glioblastoma multiforming. It's the worst kind that you can get. He was only 31 at the time. And so after his surgery and um, chemotherapy, 
David asked his oncologist, is there anything I can do to live healthily, to live healthier, to avoid the cancer coming back? You know, any diet, any exercises, anything to do or anything to avoid. And the response he got, he felt was a little bit disappointing. So his oncologist said basically, look, and he wrote this in his book, there is nothing special to do. Lead your life normally. If your tumor comes back, we'll detect it early. And in this domain, that is of exercise, diet and outlook, do what you like. We don't have any um, scientific evidence that any of these prevent a relapse. When you're a doctor and you've just been told that you have the worst type of brain cancer you could possibly get, and after you've had your surgery, you've told that there's nothing you can do, and you're a researcher, um, most of us would not be happy with that answer. And sure enough, David was quite dissatisfied. And said, is that really the case? And so he put his research skills to use. And he did a lot of research to find out, is that really so? And through his own research, he founded a new way of managing cancer sufferers. And that from his studies, he actually changed the way cancer management uh, was done at his hospital. What did he find? Now, I'm going to summarize it for brevity just to focus on the lifestyle part. But cancer effectively needs three things to thrive. And, or rather, cancer, there's three things that cancer does not like. And these three things prevent cancer from thriving. If the immune system attacks the cancer, the cancer gets killed out. If there's no inflammation present, um, that also helps. Um, this is simplified, obviously. But if there's no inflammation present, that inflammation is helpful for cancer. So if it's absent, cancer just doesn't grow as well. It can't invade other territories. And also, cancer needs a blood supply. If there's no blood supply, if there's no nutrients for the cancer to feed on, the cancer dies. And so here are some um, photos of some of the studies that he found from one of his researchers. Now, what this is showing is basically how much um, the extracts from these different types of food suppress cancer growth when it's applied directly to cancer cells, cancer cell cultures in a, in a dish. Okay, and this is just, so this is a study in dishes, not in humans. But what's really interesting to find is that garlic, leeks, scallions, Brussels sprouts, different types of cabbages, and um, all these vegetables have amazing um, ability to inhibit cancer growth. This is looking at um, colon cancer, so bowel cancer, can bowel cancer. Um, this is, is looking at brain cancer cultures. And again, they found that garlic, leeks, Brussels sprouts, it's very similar players again. The garlics, the leeks, the cabbages, the scallions, um, the, the cruciferous vegetables, so that's cauliflower and, um, and broccoli. Again, they s inhibited the cancer growth. Look at this, by 100%. For lung cancer, again, the garlics, the leeks, the scallions, and Brussels sprouts, again, suppress cancer growth in the Petri dish. And again, prostate cancer, very similar picture again, that garlics, Brussels sprouts, scallions, huge suppression of cancer growth. How does this, and breast cancer as well, we get the same idea. Other researchers have also figured that what we eat may have some impact on cancer. And so what they did was they looked at, is there a foods or things that we know of that increase apoptosis now that's a big word but what it just means is that apoptosis is programmed cell suicide and usually it's triggered when there's something abnormal in the cell so for instance if the cell has cancer then the natural human uh, body response is to try to trigger that abnormal cancer cell to die and that way it just kills the cancer it's also normal that if the cell has a virus for instance that again the immune system picks it up and triggers that cell to to die so this is looking at what can we, what foods or what agents do we have that triggers apoptosis in cancer cells, the, you know, program cell death so that it just, the cancer cells suicide and so it doesn't become a problem for the rest of the body. And so we see this table here from one of the studies and I've summarized it here. But these foods induce apoptosis in cancer cells in the, in the science lab. Turmeric, green tea, soybeans, cruciferous vegetables. So cruciferous vegetables are your broccolis, your cabbages, and your um, cauliflower. Uh, cruciferous means this means cross. If you cut the heads off these, um, cut the heads off these vegetables and look at the stem cross section, they all have look like a cross appearance. Um, celery, green capsicum, peppermint, tomato, pomegranate, uh, pigmented fruits and veggies, mango, olives, and you see the list. Garlic and onions pop up again. Um, so again, it's your vegetables, it's your fruits, 
that are coming up in this list. Um, we talked about before how cancers need a good blood supply um, to be able to thrive. Well, researchers then said, look, if that's the case, is there any diets or any foods that we know of or any agents that we know of that can block the blood vessel growth to try to prevent cancers from getting access to nutrients? So if we think of like a war zone, how do we cut off the enemy supply lines so that the troops at the front lines cannot get food, cannot get reinforcements? Same idea with the cancer. What can we do to cut off the blood supply? And so here we're seeing um, a graph. So the very top things is when the, you just have blood vessels. So that's obviously full vessel growth. Uh, but what's really interesting is that the lower down we go, the more heavily we see um, blood vessel growth suppressed. And what's very interesting is as we go down the list, we see that a lot of foods show up, citrus fruits, citrus rather, of two different types of citrus fruit um, categories um, cause significant uh, reductions in blood vessel growth. Red grapes, garlic, soy, berries, parsley, artichoke, soy extract. All these work tremendously at decreasing um, uh, uh, blood vessel growth to, to, to try to block cancer growth. And in fact, some of these work much better than um, medications. Like some of these, dexamethasone was a common medication that we use. And, and certainly the citrus, the garlics, the soys, the berries and parsley do much better than dexamethasone. Does this diet work? There's no hard and fast, um, strict scientific um, studies of high rigor done to prove it. But there is um, David's life. He followed what he practiced. He followed what he preached. And he aimed an additional 19 years of life living with the shadow of his brain cancer hanging over him. Now, that's quite a feat because what you have to realize is that glioblastoma multiforme is the worst type of brain cancer anyone can get. The average survival from time of diagnosis is 12 to 18 months. You get diagnosed and routinely most people will die within one to one and a half years within the time of diagnosis. Only 25% su survive, survive to a year or more and 5% survive to five years or more. And David lived four times, almost four times the upper limit. He lived 19 years. He died age 50 after succumbing to the return of his glioblastoma multiforme brain cancer, um, having come back a year before that. So does it work or did it not work? Why did his cancer come back? And so in short, uh, as he reviewed his life, he, he, what he basically said was, look, I haven't been living the ideal embodiment of what an anti-cancer lifestyle should look like. He can himself confess that he had too many things going on. He was giving too many talks. He was doing too much research to share about these new findings that he actually didn't look after himself the way that he should have. But as he was preparing to die, um, his final statement to his patients, to his colleagues, um, and was, was this. All too often patients hear that do whatever you want to in terms of complementary treatment. It won't do any harm, but it may not do much good either, he wrote. That statement is false, scientifically false, he wrote, and it's everything I have fought against. That's Professor David Servan Schreiber's view, based on what he's looked at at the research. We're going to move from cancer now and also now look at immune function. You know, studies look at um, looking at the, an older person's, we know that for older people, their response to vaccines is not great. And so this study looked at an older person's response to the pneumococcal vaccine. And so what they did was that three months before they got their vaccine, half of them got to eat three months for three months, greater than or equal to five serves of fruit and vegetables per day. And then the other group just had two serves of fruit and vegetables per day. And three months later, they were both given the vaccine. A month after vaccination, Everyone had their bloods drawn to see how their immune system responded to the vaccine. And what we see here is that those who ate five portions or more of fruit and vegetables per day, their immune response to the vaccine was almost double that of those who only had two portions of fruit and vegetables per day. That's amazing. Now, the, probably one of the largest areas where we have a lot of immune cells and our immune system is our gut. You know, 
On one side of the gut is all this bacteria. On this other side is your sterile body. And obviously you don't want the two to mix because otherwise you can get quite sick. And lining the gut um, is a soldier cell called the intraepithelial lymphocytes. These soldier cells are quite amazing. They do two things. They maintain the health of your gut lining. So they're like engineers. They make sure that the structures are okay. If anything needs fixing, they'll fix it for you. But they're also soldiers. They're your first line of defense. They're called IELs for short. And so what scientists have found is that cruciferous vegetables, so we've mentioned that before in the cancers, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the cabbages, these contain a high level of a compound that for short we call I3C or indole 3 carbonyl And what's really important about I3C is that these help these soldier cells, the IELs, it helps maintain them. That is, if someone has broccoli, it keeps the soldier cells alive, but it also makes them more active, more attentive. They're more careful in trying to look for, uh, it's like an adrenaline shot for them. So it not only keeps them healthy, but also gives them an adrenaline shot so that the soldier cells are more active trying to look for invaders. Um, what else do diets do from an immune system perspective? We, you may remember when we talked about water in one of our previous talks, um, the Origin series, um, I think it was talk three, we talked about water, the, um, uh, the, we talked about the natural killer cell, which is um, a cell that is useful for detecting if your normal cells have anything abnormal with them. Normal cells become abnormal if they have a virus invading them or if they've become cancerous. And so what the natural killer cell is, is it, it sees the cells and says, oh, you're not looking normal. And then it goes and kills that cell to stop the issue from developing. So hopefully to prevent the, can uh, the cancer or kill the virus in the early stage before it becomes a full-blown viral attack. Now we know that exercise, strenuous exercise that is, it commonly drops these natural killer cells after the strenuous exercise and it normally halves it. And so these um, researchers in athletics were trying to find out is there a way we can prevent that? So they gave athletes, um, they assigned some to eat 250 grams, that's two punnets of blueberries, every single day for six weeks. That's an expensive diet but well, it may be worth it. Just have a read. Um, and so they had um, two punnets of blueberries every single day for six weeks. And then on the on the day of their exercise, they got them to eat three punnets. And then um, within an hour, they got them to do their exercise. They all ran for about two and a half hours at a VO2 max of 72%. That's pretty intense exercise. And what they found was that at the start of the exercise or before the exercise, the blueberries had increased the amount of natural killer cells by double compared to those who weren't on the blueberries. And that after the exercise, sure enough, the natural killer cells did drop, but because the people who were eating blueberries, blueberries had so much natural killer cells to begin with, their drop um, was less significant than those who did not have the blueberries. In other words, blueberries are good for your natural killer cells. Um, are there any other foods that are beneficial? Well, we have something called immunoglobulins. They're like little um, feelers, or you could think of them as like fly type. They're sticky. They grab onto the things that are going to cause issues. And like a fly, a fly sticks to fly type, and it takes a fly out of action, so it can't bother you. Same with this. This is an immune um, structure that goes and picks up and binds onto problem, uh, problem creating bugs, bacteria, viruses, and neutralizes them. And this type of um, immune structure is found on your mucous membrane. So in your lining of your nose, in your lining of your mouth, the lining of your airways, etc. So salivary IgA is quite important and eating button mushrooms increases salivary IgA. Why that's important is because um, this is one of the early um, lines of defense, especially because this is the route through which we pick up our coughs and our colds or respiratory infections. And they do, all these things invade through our mucous membranes. So button mushrooms are good for your immune systems. And so what we're seeing here is a common pattern that, that there was no mention of meat or anything else, but the plant-based foods all are important for your immune system, all are important to manage cancer and lower the risk of cancer, prevent cancer, or all the plant foods are important for preventing diabetes, managing and reversing diabetes, preventing and managing heart disease and stroke and cardiovascular disease, and even important for all-cause mortality. What else does a whole food plant-based diet do? 
We're going to look now at the gut microbiome. This is an area of developing research. And what this is, is it um, it's basically describes the community of bacteria that normally lives inside our gut. Now, science is starting to learn just how important these organisms are and that if we look after the microbiota, that is the bugs that live in our guts, if we look after them, um, this can have an impact on our health. And so how, how do we look after them? By how we eat. Here is a summary of the science um, in that chart on the right. And so what we're seeing here is that red is detrimental and green is beneficial. If we have high sugar intake, we have excess animal protein consumption, if there is saturated fatty acids, if we take certain medications, so particularly antibiotics and medications of the Nexium or Somac class, proton pump inhibitors, that this can lead to changes in the microbiome such that it increases the risk of a person developing diabetes, of having heart disease, of increasing inflammation both in the gut and around the body, and also um, causing possible changes in, co um, in cognition. At the same time, the green, the probiotics, the dietary fiber intake, and again, fiber only comes from plant sources, not from meat. So dietary fiber, probiotics, these help the microbiome in your gut. It helps the microbiota and it decreases the risk of insulin, decreases the risk of heart disease, and it decreases inflammation. Further studies have shown that even the type of protein makes a difference. Plant-based protein increases the good bacteria that we want to have more of and decreases the bad bacteria that we don't want. And in so doing, it increases the health of the gut barrier and it decreases inflammation. The opposite is true though of animal protein. This increases the bad bacteria and decreases the good bacteria. And in so doing, it increases inflammation and then increases the risk of heart disease and also of inflammatory bowel disease. And so an international review of all available evidence that was done on um, how the microbiome and how we look after it and its impact on human health, um, this was done in 2020. And so these are the conclusions. Fiber is key to the healthy gut bacteria. And in turn, this helps human health. A high fat, low carbohydrate diet is bad for your microbiome and therefore it is also bad for your health. A low fat, high carbohydrate diet, so low fat, high carb diet is good for your microbiome health and so therefore it is also good for human health. And particularly we want it to be high in unrefined carbohydrates. So in other words, we don't want you to have high carbs when we're having lots of biscuits, crackers, cakes, sweets. That's not the type of carbs we're talking about. We're talking about unprocessed, unrefined fiber and, and things that you'd commonly see in a whole foods plant-based diet. Food as natural as what it can be. This type of diet is what will help keep your gut bacteria healthy and in turn keep you healthy. Studies from Europe and Asia extol the benefits of a whole foods and plant-based diet and the associations between specific dietary components and health and disease are strong. That's a conclusion of this very recent paper that was just published just last year. So, um, sure, um, whole foods plant-based diet is great, but is there anything that we need to be concerned about? Good question. We have to... Um, Firstly, we'll just um, see whether can we actually even eat a whole foods plant-based diet and be healthy? Well, this was something that the American Dietetics Association looked at, and this is their position statement based on all available evidence when they made this statement. It is the position of the American Dietetics Association that appropriately planned, so the key word is appropriately planned, vegetarian diets, including total vegetarian or vegan diets, are healthful, nutritionally adequate, and may provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. Well-planned vegetarian diets are appropriate for individuals during all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, that's breastfeeding, infancy, so as a baby, childhood and adolescence, and for athletes. And so that's what the American Dietetics Association says, their position statement. 
Now, when we say well planned, there are some areas we are concerned about that you need to keep a close eye on. What are those areas? These, protein, iron, calcium, B12, and omega-3. And I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly, but just take a screenshot of it. Um, so protein, commonly most people feel that if you're gonna eat plants, how and where do you get your protein from? Um, in fact, there are good sources of protein. You just need to know where to look. If you just have greens on your plate and nothing else, that's an un unhealthy whole foods plant-based diet. A well-planned one will have variety. So where can we get plant-based protein from? Well, animal-based protein, this is just looking at 10 gram equivalents. 10 gram equivalents of animal-based protein is two small eggs, a cup of low-fat milk, 35 grams, so that's a third of a serve of lean beef or lamb, 40 grams of chicken or 50 grams of tuna. Um, Plant-based, 10 grams equivalent of protein is four slices of bread, 300 ml soy milk, three quarter cup or 150 grams of lentils or kidney beans. So that's about a serve. 200 grams of baked beans. Again, a small serve, a small can. 120 grams of tofu, one serve. 60, nut, 60 grams of nuts or three cups of cooked rice. What does this look like? Now, what's important to know is that what is a person's protein requirement? It's about a gram of protein per day for each kilogram of body weight you have. And that's based on your ideal body weight. So in other words, if you're 60 kilos or 70 kilos and you're at an ideal body weight, then you're aiming to have 60 grams of protein if, you have, if you're 60 kilograms heavy or 70 grams of protein if you're 70, grams heavy, 70 kilos heavy. So this diet I've just put together based on someone who's 70 kilos heavy. So wake up in the morning, they have four slices of wholemeal bread. That's, on, that's already, as we saw before, 10 grams of protein and one and a half tablespoons of peanut butter spread across those. That's another 10 grams of protein. A bowl of muesli about 10 grams with uh, 100 grams with 200 ml soy milk. Altogether, 38 grams of protein. A small bowl of rice, some beans and mushrooms, and three quarter cups of lentils for lunch will give you 17 grams of protein. And a small bowl of rice, a serve of tofu, honey ginger, um, with some spinach and goji berries. That's your dinner. And that is 70 grams of protein in a day. So it's quite achievable So for someone who's 70 kilos. How about for iron? Now, what's really interesting is that these two tables show your per serve of food iron content. So a serve of beef is 100 grams cooked, and that's 3 milligrams of iron. Your serve of spinach cooked is 145 grams. That's 4.5 milligrams of iron. There is more spinach in a serve of spinach, sorry, there is more iron rather in a serve of spinach than there is in a serve of beef. Quite amazing. And again, breakfast cereal, fortified, 2.5 grams. There's many places, if you look on that right hand side, lentils, kidney beans, tofu, they all have quite high iron content. Now, what, why is it that people are concerned? It's because the iron in plant-based foods are, is in a different form and so therefore it's less readily absorbed. But there is a way you can change the form of iron in plant-based foods so it becomes like the form in meat-based foods. And what do we add to that? Vitamin C. If you have vitamin C in the same meal, you're going to change the iron in your plant-based foods to a more absorbable form. And so what it's really important is you have your spinach. If you have it as a salad, please squeeze fresh lemon juice over the top of it or have slices of oranges in your salad. If you're going to have it as a stir fry, capsicum is really high in vitamin C. Stir fry it with capsicum. If you can't add your vitamin C in any of your um, any part of that meal because it just the flavors don't match, finish off your meal with some citrus fruits, kiwi fruit, oranges, mandarins, whatever you want. As long as there's vitamin C in the same meal, so it has to be in the same meal, not in the same mouthful, but same meal. But as long as there's vitamin C in the same meal, it will help you to absorb the iron out of that meal. And sources of um, iron from a plant-based source um, classically are the dark green leafy vegetables. But we saw before also lentils, kidney beans, tofu. So that's iron. Calcium. Calcium is actually, um, we, everyone thinks of milk and cow's milk, but in fact, because of fortification, soy milk has the same amount of calcium as one cup of soy milk has the same amount of calcium as one cup of milk. But because of how tofu is made, a cup of tofu, which is about a serve, 
a cup of tofu, okay, a little bit over you know, but a cup of tofu has more than double the amount of calcium that you find um, compared to a cup of milk. You just see here, 832 milligrams per cup of firm tofu versus 367 milligrams per cup of fat, low fat milk. B12, um, in the Western world, um, it's often fortified in your milk replacements. Uh, particularly, I like So Good brand because they fortify everything across the, uh, their range. Whereas for some of your other So Good mil uh, uh, your milk replacement brands like Vitasoy, you have to just read the label. It's not and not all soy milk has B12 added to it. But you can, if you're vegetarian and you have eggs and dairy, B12 is found in eggs and dairy. And if you're a vegan, then probably the supplement is the best way to go. But it is fortified in your um, milk replacements and in certain foods. Now, omega-3 um, is something else that's really important for nerve developments, for brain development, for eye development, especially in children um, and in pregnant ladies who are um, carrying their um, pre pregnancy because bubs needs a lot of omega-3. Um, now, where can we find that? Well, it, it's felt that DHA and EPA are the better forms of omega-3 and they classically come from fish. But spirulina, which is a plant-based form, actually has DHA and EPA. And so spirulina, one tablespoon, actually has a fair bit of omega-3. Um, other things that are very good omega-3 sources are your chia seed and your flax seed, your walnuts. If you have flax seed, another name for that is linseed, please grind it up so that you can absorb it because um, if it's in the full husk, it's a lot harder to absorb the omega-3 out of it. Now, we've learned a lot about diet and its important blessings for us. But, you know, God tells us that there is something else as important as food for our bodies. And what is that? It's God's word, our spiritual food. You know, Jesus tells us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. As important as prayer is, as, as important as um, food is for our bodies, um, the, the bread of life, the word of God, the Bible. That is just as important for us spiritually. And you may remember that previously I've said that um, prayer is the breath of the soul. Well, this is the food of the soul. No Bible. No, don't spend time reading God's word and we will be end up in big strife. We just looked at Jesus' example. You know, when we as humans face and deal with issues, trials, troubles, when we deal with the cancer of sin, we look to Jesus to see what he did in a similar circumstance. What did he do when he was faced with trials, with temptations, with, um, with difficulties? We see in Matthew that during the temptation of Jesus, three times when Satan tempts him, Jesus responds by saying, It is written. It is written. And again, it is written. The Bible and the Bible only. And that is what God, what Jesus used when he was here on earth. How much more important it is for us mere mortals to spend more time in God's word, to know um, how we can, uh, we can survive spiritually. As we look at the armor of God in Ephesians, you know, it's very clear. T and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the only piece of the armor in God's armor, God's armamentarium that we can use for offensive battle. Everything else is defensive. And that's exactly why Jesus used it. You know, it is with the word of God that we will defeat the temptations of Satan. God's word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, says David. God's word is important because it tells us how it is we should live, what it is, um, what our life purpose is, what is the meaning of life, but also um, what it is that we need to do, what it is that we need to choose to be able to be in contact and communion with God and above all, how it is that we can be saved. And why is the word important? Why is God's word important? We read, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Jesus tells us clearly, God's word is important because God's word talks about Jesus. And Jesus is important. Jesus is the author of life, the source of all life, and certainly the source of our salvation and our strength. You know, God's word is also important because of what it does in our lives as we read it, 
as we meditate on it, as we take it in, and as we choose to live it out. You know, for the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Why is God's Word important? Because God's Word is living and powerful. And just like at creation, when God spoke and immediately things were created, just so God speaks power into your life today as we read God's Word. And so we may not have the ability to overcome temptation, but that is okay. We're not, we're not the ones in charge of overcoming the temptation. But as we spend time in God's Word, as we spend time in prayer, it is God who works in you through the power of His living Word that helps you to overcome your challenge, helps you to overcome your temptation, helps you to become the new person, that, um, the new child of God that Jesus wants you to be. And so as we finish today, um, I'd like for you to um, reflect on not only the blessings of following God's original diet, the whole foods plant-based diet, but also the importance of the bread of life, God's word. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we just want to thank you, Lord, that as we've learned today about the blessings of food from your original diet, but also the blessings of your word. Lord, may we, with wisdom, know how to apply this to our hearts and know how it is that, Lord, we might not only eat healthily for our physical bodies, but eat and read and take into our minds and hearts your spiritual word, that we might grow spiritually strong and be transformed into your likeness by your inworking spirit in us through your word. And so, Lord, we just want to lift all of this into your hands and we ask that you'll um, bless us now. And we ask all of this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Once more, thank you for joining us for online church on the Origins program, God's Whole Person Wellness Plan. Please join us again next week as we look at the important topic of rest. I promise you'll, you'll learn some new things. Very interesting. Um, if you've enjoyed this program, please in, um, invite your friends or your family to join us to watch as well. Again, we'll be joined uh, live again next Sunday, 10 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Thank you once more. And just to conclude, you know, God really has provided for all our needs at the creation. 